Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, welcome to PIDE webinar on piety and political masculinity in Pakistan. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, be hosting two esteemed guests, Dr. Afia Sherbano Zia and Mr. Nadeem Farooq Paracha uh, in today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Afia Zia is a feminist scholar, author, and an active member of human rights and women's movements in Pakistan. She's taught gender studies at the University of Toronto, Canada, and Habib University in Pakistan. She's authored several books, three books. Uh, the most recent one is Faith and Feminism in Pakistan. And she's published over uh, you know, several uh, peer-reviewed essays in scholarly journals, including Science, Feminist Review, and International Feminist Journal of Politics. Uh, her current research, the one that we'll be talking about today, is focused on uh, biased and populist uh, political Muslim masculinities and on the Me Too movement in Pakistan. She's currently serving as a visiting scholar at the Wesleyan University. Welcome, Dr. Afia Zia. Uh, Mr. Nadeem Farooq Paracha is a renowned journalist, author, cultural critic, and historian. He writes for Pakistan's leading English news publication, Dawn. He's authored seven books on uh, social and political history of Pakistan, including The, pa uh, the Pakistan Anti-Hero, End of the Past, Points of Entry, Muslim Modernism, A Case for Naya Pakistan, Soul Rivals, and uh, The Reluctant Republic, The Ethos and Mythos of Pakistan. His latest book, For Faith, State and Soul, was recently published in August 2022. The book is a history of popular culture in Pakistan. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, looking forward to our discussion today. Um, the format for the webinar is uh, such that I think there's a uh, there's a presentation that uh, Dr. Rafia will begin, and after Do Dr. Uh, Zia is done with her presentation, uh, our second speaker, Mr. Nadeem Farooq Paracha, will speak. We'll have about an hour um, of discussion, and uh, after that, we can continue with questions and answers, and uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Um, Dr. Zia. Thank you so much, Maria. And also thanks to uh, Pied, especially Fahad Zulfikar, for inviting me to speak on the themes of the recent article in South Asian popular culture that you mentioned. So the article is really just an academic essay. It compares the populist leaderships of Prime Ministers Narendra Modi in India and Imran Khan at the time in Pakistan. And my core argument is that the pietist and populist masculinities and politics of both leaders have more in common with each other than we like to believe. So I'm just going to summarize my analysis, as you say, for 15, 20 minutes, because anyone interested in the details can read the article. But I wanted to broaden the conversation by discussing these themes of piety, populism, and masculinities with Nadeem more closely with reference to Pakistan say that uh, my article was submitted before Imran Khan was removed from office. And subsequently, uh, there has been this intriguing, competing masculinist tussle between Imran Khan and Pakistan's chief of army staff, General uh, Bajwa, representing really what is two state pillars in conflict with each other. And Imran Khan's unprecedented emasculation and impropriety, improprietous language that is aimed at the establishment and at the army leadership. I mean, it makes for good entertainment on one level, but it is also sociologically relevant and it has potential political implications as we've seen in the last few days as well. But even academically, um, the insult of referring to the army leaders as neutrals carries such uh, an underlying sexual innuendo, an innuendo that is aimed at the masculinity of, of General Bajwa. It insinuates impotency. It insinuates being genderless um, or insufficiently male. And I think we can come back to that. Uh, but, but it's an interesting development that's happened, which couldn't be included in the article. So first, uh, I just want to define some of the terms that I use in my article briefly. Piety is different from religiosity. Religion is associated with the more formal, with orthodoxy, with how the state instrumentalizes it. But piety tends to be more personal, social, spiritual, informal, uh, and even carries heterodoxical possibilities. Right? 
and we know that both religious and pietous politics have coexisted in Pakistan. But after the events of 9-11 in 2001, much more work has been done on what has been called the politics of piety. And a lot of hope has been invested mostly by Muslim scholars who are based in the West or in Western academia in the potential of piety as an alternative to or somehow independent and delinked from radical or Islamic politics. And there's also been a lot of romance in this time period of over Muslim women's exercise of piety. There's been a lot of defensive proposals over the need to understand, negotiate, hybridize Muslim women's piety within women's rights agendas and within feminist politics. Now, this is a big shift from the earlier, more radical feminist politics of the 1980s and 1990s in Pakistan, which had this very clear Marxist or left understanding about the patriarchal nature and benefits of religion, and where women's rights activists were committed to secular ends and had a vision where Muslims were not, um, uh, Muslim women's religiosity was considered to be false consciousness, rightly or wrongly. Uh, but progressive movements were committed to secular ends and a vision where Muslims were not privileged as having exceptional needs or different needs or faith-based interests and, and rights. That, that was not the vision. And the point of civil rights movements at the time was to transform state and society, not negotiate with patriarchy or religion, and not to pretend that the master's tools, in this case religion, can liberate women or minorities or win them equality. It can empower them uh, a little, but uh, not equality. Equality is an unlikely and unproven aim in this regard. But in any case, most Pakistani feminists were clear that in a religious state, majoritarianism will gain legitimacy and monoculturalism will thrive. So they were they opposed all the forces that supported either a theocratic state or, or religious laws. <clears throat> the second theme on populism. Now, plenty of work has been done on populism and even the role of religion in the discipline of international relations. But my article makes a case for considering the role of piety and preaching and spiritual devotion and proselytizing by political leaders as a driver of their populism. So the current wave of uh, male populist leaders, whether it's Putin or Trump or Bolsonaro or Erdogan, there are lots of political leaders who are or have been religious or pious or spiritual. But both Modi and Imran Khan are elected populists, they're not dictators. And they perform their piety not as an incidental, but as a very deliberate core part of their governance, right? They depend on piety as a resource and even a substitute for scientific or economic logic. Um, they even rationalize discriminatory attitudes to gendered and religious minorities by invoking piety. They mythologize history, they fictionalize it. And Modi's and the BJP is of course far worse in this regard because mm -hmm. their governance is xenophobic and they target and persecute Muslims unapologetically in India. Imran Khan's pietist populism simply worsens pre-existing persecutions of Ahmadis and Hazaras in particular. And of course, Imran Khan has no interest in equality for women or, or gendered minorities, just this benevolent attitude, charitable at best, which <clears throat> ironically, echoes uh, colonial policies uh, that he is critical of. But anyway, uh, all these false promises to liberate us from this imagined slavery, gulami. But even so, I have hesitated uh, to classify either of these regimes as fascist, despite the symptoms and despite these leaders' flirtations with fascist policies. I would say that Modi's pietist populism feeds genocidal xenophobia, it feeds it, while Imran Khan's underwrites and boosts religious and gendered chauvinism in Pakistan. Uh, of course, Modi's work is much harder. He's been more successful, but his work is harder because he has had to subvert the secular nature of the Indian state. However 
compromised or however moth eaten it was. But still, the BJP claims victimhood by state secularism, not Western slavery. Right? The BJP argues that India follows a pseudo secularism, which is only appeasing Muslim minorities at the expense of Hindu sentiments and Hindu rights. Uh, Imran's task is, is easier because there is no secular resistance in Pakistan, with the exception of the Women's Action Forum for the last 35, 40 years. In fact, piety is defended in Pakistan by progressive thinkers, and there have been no efforts made to develop secular politics or to consolidate secular possibilities or a pushback to religious politics. And this is a new defeat because until the 1990s, this was a very vibrant, viable vision and goal amongst the progressives and the left. Um, now, my criticism of pious populist masculine styles is not to say that politicians who instrumentalize piety will all end up committing genocide. That's not my claim. But given the surge of academic and political theses around the politics of piety after 9-11, the events of 9-11, I think it is important 20 years later to analyze the results of these piety, this piety politics. It's easy to spin a theory but what about reckoning about the pragmatic consequences of those theory? So <clears throat> my article was to showcase how these theories have unraveled. And it argues that the real benefits of piety in Pakistan have been usurped by populists like Imran Khan, and to a lesser extent by the Khadim Rizvis of the Tehrik e Labek Pakistan, because the beauty of piety is it cannot be measured or judged by man-made constitution or man-made laws. And even parliament is not the stage for the populist, right? Instead, populists are elevated as supra beings. Um, and <clears throat> when they claim piety as their calling, when they claim piety as their cause, only the rules of divinity apply to them. They are only answerable to the divine not mere voters or power emissaries, or even the army which claims to be the guardian of the Islamic Republic, right? So these populists perform for a different kind of audience and they appeal that they should only be judged by God. And they claim that they are guided by holy scripts which are above the constitution, um, at which they interpret themselves, but, but still they're certainly not guided by the laws of the election commission or mere mortal rules and policies. So things like, you know, Tosha Khana pilfridges, uh, they're non-crimes, you know, near and saf hai, it can't be a crime, right? And the no confidence vote and democratic technicalities are dispensable. Only abstract qualities matter, not empirical, rational, Western scientific nonsense. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, of course, democracy becomes the collateral in this process. And <clears throat> the Vedas and Islamic civilization are invoked by these leaders as alternatives. They are supported then by props like nostalgia and films and media, which is why celebrities are important in this game. They help the leaders to fictionalize this script of a new nationalism, where the populist leader is the hero, the savior, uh, and he will rescue people from corrupt elites. He will rescue the people from the West, from Huni liberals, from the left-leaning press, and even the satirist. Um, in fact, satire is the worst enemy of the populist because it deflates inflated egos. It mocks them. It uh, demeans them. It humanizes them. So I also make the argument that Actually, neither Modi nor Imran Khan are remotely anti-elites, uh, whether it's economic or power elites, whether it's the religious elites, or even community elites. They are not against these elites, and it makes for an interesting contradiction about what is supposed to be the core characteristic of a populist that they talk about anti-elitism, but it's complete and a complete eyewash in the case of these two. And... <clears throat> That is why I categorize Modi's rule as Hindu economicus and Imran Khan's as homo Islamicus, because theirs are policies that are committed, very committed to neoliberal economics, 
uh, to the IMF. They are committed to big businesses and to crony capitalism, right? And what's interesting is that these policies should not be popular with the masses, right? But because they, they are painted and branded with piety, it suggests that this is somehow ethical economics uh, or ethical economics, um, just like halal vaccines, right? You brand them with this pietist cover and it suggests that they are somehow relevant, important and authentic. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, it is only charity and sharia and langars which are reserved for the unwashed masses, you know, at least Modi has installed latrines in India, you know, for us, we just have abstract promises and nothing delivered. Um, and unfortunately, our privileged class intelligentsia is fine with this. And our middle classes, the middle classes love this consumer capitalism with the icing of piety, you know, it's completely their agenda. Um, and so uh, that brings me to the last, the third and last theme of the article, which is on masculinity. Now, this is a more recent subject of academic study. And perhaps the most well-known work on this is by R.W. Cornell, who coined the term hegemonic masculinity in the 1990s, which essentially defines or explains how one dominant form of masculinity, heterosexual masculinity, becomes the commonsensical standard uh, that all men have to aspire to, and all of them are measured against that standard. <clears throat> but uh, recently, French scholars have traced the history of masculinity, and they have found that the central signifiers of masculinity since ancient times are three things. They're weapons, uh, they are locomotives or vehicles, cars, and meat, especially raw meat. Um, so these are interesting continuities uh, in, in the tropes of, of masculinity. And of course, feminist crit critiques of masculinities have argued that men use masculine power to dominate over other genders, but they pay a big price for this. Um, and the price is insecure egos, uh, denial of their own vulnerabilities, fear of being rejected, and shame for being insufficiently masculine or being feminine in any way. Um, and of course, the ultimate uh, price is, is lower life expectancy. <clears throat> There's also a debate about this thing of toxic versus benign masculinities, which doesn't interest me very much. I think more interesting is this notion of protection and honor as masculine traits, because these very easily tip into violence. They justify violence. Uh, and so infantilizing citizens, infantilizing women in the name of protecting them becomes a form of control over them. And it rationalizes ownership or guardianship as tropes of masculinity. And I've always asked this question that protecting them from whom? Basically, you're protecting them from other men. So it's this kind of patriarchal com competition, which is not really interested in men or children or the physically or socially weaker segment. Uh, and protecting the nation is really a euphemism for men competing for ownership of resources or power, right? So this idea of you know, protecting you from imported governments because we are the authentic uh, you know, protectors and, uh, of, of uh, the nation is, is just complete rubbish. You're not protecting the nation, just protecting your own interests, right? But, uh, but as a trait, as a characteristic, both the asexual Modi and the hypersexualized Imran, you'll notice they constantly refer to a lost Hindu or lost Muslim masculinity, respectively. Lost during colonial rule by Western powers and for Hindu by Muslim invaders also. Uh, the argument is they emasculated both communities. And what these leaders promised to do is to regain national and political manhood via a robust privileging of their religious masculinities over others. So again, a competing politics. Um, and Modi's government is rapidly repeating the theme also of rescuing Hindu women from the alleged love jihad inflicted by Muslim men in India. And in Pakistan, we mirror this to some extent. We see the rescuing of Hindu women through the practices of forced conversion 
So both and all of these fall within the same rescue narrative. And this idea of injured religious masculinity is also a very useful resource for mobilizing nationalism throughout history. I mean, Nadine will, will talk about this, I'm sure. It inspired anti-colonial uprisings in British India. Then it led to the communal 1920s, and then it peaked in the fratricidal uh, violence of 1947. And it continues in post-colonial India and Pakistan, even after they have become majorities in, in both countries. Um, and for my interest, of course, the gendered consequences of this are very clear. These anxious masculinities in both countries. It infiltrates security paradigms. And I have listed the negative impact on women, women politicians, women journalists, women activists in both countries. But the interesting thing is that both Modi and Imran Khan's cult followers includes outspoken, diehard women supporters. And Modi at least rewards loyal women with ministerial positions and leadership roles, uh, a bit like Hitler did, I suppose. And he also delivers gendered policies, you know, local government empowerment, the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao campaign has been very successful. Imran Khan does nothing for women, right? Zero. Um, in fact, undermines their autonomy. And he's singularly only interested in their Muslimness and in their hijabs, right? So it's even more intriguing, this loyalty and passion for this philandering, underachieving, uh, but pious populist. And, uh, you know, at the risk of, 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 of you know, taking the stand, but I would go so far as to say that neither feminists nor pious women's movements in Pakistan have been able to collectivize women activists as convincingly and as quickly as Imran Khan's populist persona has. Um, and one last word on, on piety in international relations is just to say that um, women leaders in South Asia or South Asia have been popular too. Uh, and some of them have performed their piety too. But the expectations of these women has been that they should rise above their femininity and they should rule like men of the majority faith. Right? So Benazir Bhutto and, and Sonia Gandhi to a lesser extent their femininity had to be suppressed. And they did subscribe to piety to some extent, but they managed to not let this influence either their politics or their policies, right? Um, so these are some of the themes that I've explored in the article. Um, and so I'm going to now uh, ask uh, to get into these a little bit deeper with regard to Pakistan specifically. And Nadeem has explored some of these in his own work. Uh, I have some images to share. Um, and which Nadim has agreed to comment on. And so th these are sort of contemporary and uh, historical and contemporary examples. And um, finally, a few on deviant masculinities that challenge hegemonic masculinity. But I'm going to try and share that screen, Nadim. So Nadim, um, I'm, I'm sort of starting at, uh, you know, sort of this idea of early Muslim masculinities in India, I didn't go so much into over here. But you know, this particular slide, should, there's work done by Sukeshi uh, Kamra uh, on M.A. Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Um, and you know, the kind of pejorative cartoons that were shown on the eve of 1947 um, in, in showing the negative masculinities of, of these rival uh, political leaders. We have Dawn, which is Muslim League paper, showing um, all those mocking those Muslim leaders who joined Gandhi's Congress party uh, and who opposed the Pakistan movement, you know, Abul Kalam and others who are shown as ballet dancers. And on the right, we have the Congress newspaper, Congress supporting paper, where Jinnah is depicted demeaningly as the courtesan of the wife who is seducing the Maharaja of Patiala to become part of Pakistan. So just to get your comments on, on these rival nationalist masculinities. Yeah, uh, this is very interesting. I, I saw these a few years ago as well. Uh, I just want to share something uh, regarding this or perhaps uh, comment on where this sort of mindset was coming from. One of the sources was a pamphlet which was published, I think in 1939 or 40 or maybe in the mid forties, a uh, pamphlet and a leaflet uh, authored by, I don't know, some guy called Chishti, some Chishti and Abdul Sattar Niazi. 
Abdul Sattar Niazi was very young at that time. And when he came to Pakistan, he joined uh, Jamiat ul Pakistan, became an Islamic scholar. So they published, when they were young, a published a leaflet called The Scheme. And in that scheme, uh, they have this theory, which they uh, articulated in their own manner. Uh, what they did was basically they uh, merged the idea of uh, Nietzsche's Superman or the Oberman and Iqbal Shaheen, they merged together. And they said that uh, a time will come soon that uh, a Muslim Superman will emerge. And uh, they called that Superman the Khuda Mard, the Muslim strong, but sounds much better as Khuda Mard or the holy or, or, or the godly strong man, whatever. So that was, that, that sort of mindset was also developing, not among the masses as such. If you study uh, the history of the middle classes, uh, of Muslim urban middle classes and lower middle classes in India, uh, but, uh, but it was emerging in this class, the urban middle class who were educated. And uh, they often saw Gandhi and people like those as uh, not very manly. And uh, same thing, what the Hindu nationalists did was the same thing, uh, what the, the Hindu nationalists, uh, what the Muslim nationalists, uh, the radical Muslim nationalists uh, were doing with, uh, with Gandhi. So as we, as we see on the right, the May 1937 National Terror in India, this idea of Jinnah being a uh, a dancer, basically an old woman, weak, but at the same time conniving, was basically coming from the mindset of what the Hindu nationalists were developing for themselves, because they were constantly being compared and humiliated by certain Hindu uh, Muslim literature, who thought that the Hindus were not very manly people. Uh, they weren't very particularly good soldiers, and uh, they were sissies, basically. That's, that's, that's how uh, the Muslim nationalists, certain Muslim nationalists saw Hindus. So the Hindus struck back by looking at people like Jinnah and most of the top leadership of the Muslim League as uh, dry, not very manly, very effeminate uh, Muslims who were into constitutionalism and democracy and spoke, uh, and spoke with a British accent, etc. So that is, so, so the, the, the leaflet I'm talking about, the scheme, is a reaction to that. And as you go forward, uh, I'll tell you exactly where we can find that Khuda Mard, which was apparently forgotten about, that, that pamphlet was forgotten about, but it sort of survived after Pakistan came into being. And uh, we will see the emergence of a Khuda Mard a conscious or unconscious emergence for the other, or that sort of a man uh, in our political leaders, uh, which you very well summed up uh, as you move forward. Yeah. So let me just move then to post-colonial Pakistan. Um, yeah. And yeah. And so, you know, we've seen the first 20 years, um, we're already seeing, like you say, the development of a hegemonic masculinity, right? Uh, that uh, I've argued came out from the collusion of men, money, military, and more yeah. that defined Pakistan's patriarchy. So, but then in the 1970s, we have Nadeem, we have the figure of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who exemplifies a lot of the complexities and paradoxes of Pakistani Muslim uh, political masculinities as a protege of General, uh, you know, Pakistan's first military dictator, General Yu Khan. And, then he becomes president, then he's a civilian, you know, chief martial law administrator, then he's prime minister after the liberation of Bangladesh. Um, so, you know, there's this, he's also a secular socialist, non-Punjabi uh, civilian leader, which is very relevant, but has uh, the contradictions of all these autocratic traits as well. Um, he represents Sunni majoritarianism, as we know, where he stripped the Ahmadi community of their Muslimness and declared them imposter Muslims, which is a whole different thesis about how, uh, forget the Bangladeshi, you know, emasculation of the Bangladeshi man, but also the Ahmadi sort of non-Muslim um, masculinity. And I don't want to underplay the role of the Pakistan military, uh, but, you know, civilian 
uh, political narratives are replete with racist emasculation of, uh, of the Bangladeshis and of East Pakistanis who were framed as, as we saw in the first slide, just like Jinnah was, as permanently treacherous, you know, feminine. Treachery is feminine. And as Hindu, Indian infidels, you know, the whole um, uh, country of Muslims was sort of uh, uh, declared infidels in that sense. And Bhutto also used very nationalist, anti-imperialist, anti-Indian rhetoric uh, to build support and also to um, begin Pakistan's nuclear weapons program in, in 72. Um, so, you know, these are some of the images of his sartorial politics, which I thought was interesting. And you and I have had this conversation about the Mao cap um, and yeah. his commitment to socialism. Uh, and then, and then his, his wife, Mr. Kuto, who is not in Parda, and then, of course, Mujibur Rahman on the right, a masculinity that, an image that we are never taught and never brought up uh, about. So, your comments on this. Yeah, I think, can you go forward? It's a very interesting, I think uh, that that image encapsulates exactly what Sudhakar Bhutto was or became. That right, the right one where he's riding a white horse. I was talking about the, now in the scheme, the Khudamad is imagined as a Muslim carrying a green flag and riding a white horse. And now you can conquer the non-Muslim world and uh, and, and, and sort of teach other Muslims uh, the right Islam. So this image, just want to talk with some, some information about this image. This was uh, published, uh, printed during the 1970 election campaign. Uh, basically uh, for certain constituencies in, uh, in Punjab, Karachi and uh, the former NWFP. Now, why did this poster or this, this, this image appear? Till then, there was Zulfikar Ali Bhutto leading a so-called socialist party, which believed in democracy, which had uh, Marxist, socialist, social democrats, uh, and uh, all sorts of progressive uh, uh, members, and they called themselves a social democratic party, which believed in socialist economics, etc. So in 1969 or 70, early 1970, Abul Ala Maududi authored a fatwa against socialism. It was obviously uh, aimed at Pakistan Peoples Party, which he called a party of communists and thus atheists. That sort of uh, worried the party leadership especially as a Prakari uh, He didn't want to be seen as someone who's, uh, who's secular, who's communist, like communists are in, let's say, Soviet Union. They had no problem with communists in China at that point in time, for some odd reason. So now here, it, some, this says something very interesting in the context of uh, what we're discussing here. Um, here we see Bhutto as the Khudambar, as the manly, macho Muslim soldier, as, as is uh, popularly uh, imagined by a lot of Pakistanis, thanks to the way we are taught history and other fantasies. Uh, he wanted to come across as, 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 a, as, a, as a macho Muslim man, like uh, the Muslim soldiers of York, Salauddin Ayubi and other. Maududi, he also wanted to make Maududi look like as a very dry, um, theoretical Muslim who didn't have the characteristics of a Muslim man who is able to go out and boldly face any conspiracies against Pakistan. And therefore, so. He, through this poster, is not only trying to suggest that he is a Muslim and a very uh, gallant Muslim man, but he is also a Muslim who doesn't sort of get into theories and uh, other things which Madhu Pisa did. So he is also oh, a different kind of more activist Muslim who is better than 
Jamaat Islami Muslims who he doesn't, uh, who they, he, he feels uh, just sit in their drawing rooms and read books and write theories on political Islam, etc. So uh, this is image again was adopted by an image which appeared in 1965 or during this 1965 war between Pakistan and India, an image appeared with Ayub Khan, moderate, progressive, but a dictator nonetheless. He appeared as a Muslim soldier again on a white horse. And uh, till then Ayub Khan we see wants to be portrayed as a progressive man who's gentle, benevolent. Uh, but the reality of war forced upon him. And then, of course, he knew that he will be up against in the same year. Uh, before that, he had to compete in election with a woman, against a woman, Fatma Jinnah. So that is from then onwards, we see a you can't stone and the propaganda about him taking a more, let's say, masculine, macho, uh, in, 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 including uh, uh, involving more masculine imagery. He got, starts appearing on horses. He starts appearing behind uh, 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 transport trucks, you know, riding an eagle, etc. The same is going on here with Mr. Bhutto, who was lifestyle liberal, secular, you know, uh, but had to uh, strike this masculine populist uh, uh, pose. And uh, recently we saw this in the shape of, and you very well uh, explained what Imran Khan is. And I would call Imran Khan another manifestation of the Khudamad. A lot of rhetoric, a lot of powerful imagery, you know, no action. At least Bhutto Sahib and you action, especially Bhutto Sahib. They did something. They did sort of implement certain policies. People will like it or not. But Imran Khan is the classic 21st century populist. All talk, no action. And uh, But I would call him a continuation of this imagery of Khudama, which is going on since the 1940s. And we see it in uh, Ayub Khan during the 1965 election against Fatma China and the 1965 war against India. We see it with uh, after 1970, especially after 1974, when his government started moving to the right a lot. And then we see it again, or we saw it again with the uh, rise of Imran Khan from 2011 onwards. And uh, he is constantly uh, intensifying that image. And uh, to some, it's really working for them. Yeah. But so, my question has always been, sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. you want to say something? No, my question is always, like, for example, Bhutto didn't have a lot of female admirers. Bhutto's constituency was mostly the so-called masses. The middle class dumped him uh, in the early, by 1973, you know, they were, they hated him. It was always the masses, the small farmers, the peasants, the working classes, you know, and they were mostly men. Uh, I'm sure there were women as well, but not as many women as, as Imran Khan has gathered uh, as supporters. And uh, Bhutto's popularity also didn't come from the middle classes. Uh, in fact, they abandoned him and, uh, and the movement against him in 1977 was a middle class movement, a low middle class movement of traders, shopkeepers, et cetera, funded by the industries. And those are different reasons. But again, as you, you, are, you said you were puzzled, okay, how can a man like Imran Khan, you know, who, 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 whose piety and uh, a show of piety, exhibition of piety and populism is, should be offending a lot of women. And yet we see women who practice lifestyle liberalism, for example, middle-class urban uh, women, uh, they somehow cannot see through it. They don't want to see through it. You know, I, I, I'm trying to sort of explore that as a why that is so. 
Mm-hmm. And a second second thing I would like you to comment as well, which I've been thinking recently, uh, populism is definitely not an ideology, is a way, is a style of politics, basically. You know, you uh, adopt something from the far left, adopt something from the far right, you know, and you present yourself as, as, as the savior, etc. And it's mostly to do with men. But if you see France, one of the biggest populist parties over there, the far right nationalist party over there is being led by a woman. And I've been trying to study her and she's using exactly the same imagery and the same uh, rhetoric as let's say Trump does or did or Imran does or Modi does or, or in, in that guy in Hungary does, you know? So uh, it's, 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 it is very puzzling. And uh, what is happening there? What is this woman up to? <laughs> Why is she uh, mirroring uh, men who are not very fond of treating women as equals? So Nadim, I mean, that's a, that's a big question, but the, the sort of basic response to this is that, you know, our, our entire argument is that gender suggests that men and women are actually not that, that different in terms of our ideological uh, subjects. Um, and, and why did we, do we expect uh, all women to be feminists? Uh, and why do we expect that men will only behave in a certain masculine stroke? These are learned, constructed, and especially political behavior is very learned. I mean, it's, it's taught, we learn it in our houses. We, I mean, the simple question can be that, how do we vote? The, we vote on the basis of how the family votes, right? I mean, where do we learn? I do. So you'll see even the Imran Khan phenomenon has been, and this, there's been commentary on this, on how entire families, and particularly those of the ex-servicemen or ex-army, uh, or within the, the current uh, servicemen as well, their entire families are um, you know, sort of cult followers of Imran Khan. Uh, and, and like you say, the women, uh, and these are progressive women journalists who are speaking, defending Imran's policies, and they, they spin it, they twist, uh, they, they say that he's misunderstood, which is the classic uh, defense of, of, a, of a patriarch, you know, and, and they, I think that the script is so well, um, it's, it's very hard to break that script when everything is working, uh, colluding with them. They've got the state on their side, they have media on their side, celebrities. So, um, you know, critical thinking, skepticism, a critique is never well received. It's not popular. And that is the difference between populism um, and, and critical thinking or skepticism or secular thinking. Um, and so, of course, Le Pen in, in France, uh, she's a conservative. I mean, women can be conservatives, you know, um, and, and racists and um, uh, xenophobic. Um, so, but I think the interesting comparison there between France and India is because of the nature of the state. The nature of the state always matters in these. It's not about individuals. It is where the state hinges, what the state structures do. And my interest as an activist is always to see where's the opportunity for us? Why are we not taking the current schism between the state, you know, in this case, the army and Imran Khan? Why are we as progressives not all over this? Why haven't we got an alternative rhetoric or a plan or a um, you know, yeah, analysis on this. Why do we not take advantage of it as progressive thinkers? And that's our flaw. You know, we don't have a backup plan. We just watch as spectators rather than furthering a certain agenda or just criticizing Imran Khan as liberals. That's not the point. He is a tool for us as well. Um, and, and how can we use him as a lever to create this genuine need for a distancing and removing the army from politics? Yes, we've said all these things about the army leadership as well. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, in terms of the army, let me just come to the next slide because we want to go through some of them. And in terms of, you know, sartorial politics, um, I think it's important also to see, yes, good to popularize a certain, what you're calling a lifestyle, but, you know, the shalwar kameez and, and uh, authenticity and, and style comes into it. But, you know, we've seen the military rulers, uh, how they've done this chameleon-like um, uh, adoption, you know, because it's performative, Piety is performative, but so is all politics. And what they've done over here is shifting out of the uniform when it was convenient for them to speak to global leadership, you know, as, as the leader in an Ajkan, the Islamic leader, but actually you're a military dictator. You know, both 
Ziaul Haq and General Musharraf did that. Um, and, you know, somehow um, they, they get away with this. They get away with doing this um, wardrobe change uh, and, and they use oppressive measures when they are in uniform. But when we tell them to get rid of the uniform as part of the constitution, there's a huge backlash on that, that they don't want to do. And I think this is also something that's common with, with Imran, that when they speak to Western audiences, it's a completely different messaging, pandering to a different kind of sentiment, global sentiment, and a completely different attitude reserved for, uh, for Pakistanis. Um, so I think, you know, this violation of the constitutions, the sartorial politics of both these generals, um, and, and really um, what I fail to understand is that in all of our analysis, Naveen, what we're discussing is, yes, Imran and Bajwa and Imran, what he's saying, even as follows, nobody's willing to go back and see how he, Imran Khan's government provided complete impunity to General Musharraf, legally, constitutionally, and let him get away, right? So, agar itna hi, itni taklif hai, you know, neutral se ya fojion se or whatever it is, that was your opportunity. It is still your opportunity, you know, uh, you can take that up. So, these are some of the sort of falsehoods of it. Um, We've already discussed, and you know, this is also another um, interesting period in the development of political masculinities. But here, urban masculinities, and, and you've done quite a lot of work on this. Uh, what's interesting is that economically speaking, Naveen, this is pre-liberalization in India, okay? Um, and yeah. it is also when Pakistan is embroiled in the Cold War, right, on the, on the right. Mm -hmm. So um, in Afghanistan, so there's a lot of, investment in training Mujahideen and to fight, like you say, the godless Soviet Union, etc. Um, so the Hindu right-wing Shiv Sena in India is led by Bal Thakare on the left and the secular, so-called secular political party of the MQM is founded by Altaf Hussain. And they, both of them, I think it's so interesting that at the same time period, both of them are interested in rehabilitating young Muslim and Hindu men on both sides of the border. Um, and these, these are very aggressive, you know, youth, the angry men of, of the 1980s who are portrayed in film as well. And they spurn incredible urban violence in, in the days that you and I were growing up, you know, in, in Karachi and going to university. But both these Hindu men and, and Muslim youth, they look to these leaders as a fatherly figure, as surrogate fathers, right? Which is really interesting. I don't think that Imran has that kind of calling. Uh, this is very specific, it's religious in India, and it's ethnic in, in Pakistan. Um, and so, you know, I want I wanted to get some of your comments on this because you've done quite a bit of work. Yeah, uh, both in both cases, okay, we see uh, two tendencies, one uh, Hindu nationalist or Hindu, and the other Muhajir, uh, both felt very, uh, um, they felt that they've been repressed, yeah. their identities have been repressed, both feel that way. Thakre felt that uh, secular India, so called, was, as you mentioned in your talk, the, uh, the, uh, that it was, uh, it was, uh, it was supporting or it was, it was aiding uh, Muslims more than uh, the Hindus, even though Hindus were never a homogeneous group, um, and uh, the Muslims were taking. Uh, advanced circular, uh, secularism and undermining the Hindu majority of uh, India with the help of the Congress party. And uh, on the right, when we see the Mohajirs, Mohajirs, when they started to pour into Pakistan after 1947, you know, they were one of the earliest, uh, they were very much part of the ruling elite with the Punjabis uh, till about, uh, till, till Ayub's takeover. And they've always felt being ousted They've always felt that they were the ones who were who were the main architects of the Pakistan movement. They had left their homes and they, here they were in a land where everybody was either Punjabi, Sindhi, Baloch or Pashtun. And they had no identity who they were and nobody was a Pakistan. And they had been ousted first by uh, the Pashtuns who had started to come uh, to Karachi as labor in the 1960s. And then by this Sindhi feudal lord who had come in and asked them to start with Sindhi, for example, uh, as a language because Karachi became capital of Sindh. And then uh, they were very disappointed. They thought that, okay, Ziaul Haq, he was a Mohajir in the sense he was a Punjabi, but he came from East Punjab. 
as a mahaj as a refugee they sort of maybe okay um, he might sort of re uh, reinvigorate or regenerate uh, or uh, reinstall the mahajirs back where they belong and that is at the top because they were the main uh, creators of pakistan ziaullah khan did no such thing um so that is when we saw the emergence of these militant macho uh radical mohajir young men led by this uh, former mohajir student leader uh street smart yeah clever and uh, brave strong same thing with bal thapre he is portraying a hindu he's trying to break the stereotype of the hindu which he was bothered with. like for example even if you watch how indians were are portrayed in hollywood movies still about the 1990 they were always either doing yoga or they were always talking about peace you know and and people like bal thapre and the hindu nationalists hated that it was a t- stereotype you know so they end up creating another sort of a stereotype of a hindu who's radical who who who's willing to die for it, their deities and their nationalism so this is what happened these are two people who felt uh, left out isolated and stereotyped and uh, this was the reaction bal thapre in india and altaf said in karachi hmm. but even uh, nadeem at this time you know a lot of social activities i mean of course there's also in pakistan also irani after the iranian revolution and then afghanistan and the soviet union and afghanistan um of course pietist organizations and tabligh uh, organizations and religious organizations also became militant uh, i'm not leaving them out i'm just saying that's more obvious one but what i find interesting is that everyday activity like kite flying cricket um you know and religious pageantry and and eid milad un nabi all of these uh, became political performances right they became invested with something beyond the leisure they weren't just casual cricket playing anymore right kite flying was extremely competitive and also tele evangelism rises in both countries you know the united states yes it's been around and of course the celebritization of religion so what i'm suggesting is that none of this is really brand new with the imran khan phenomenon or with modi today these have historical um, background and also in other muslim countries you know we don't have anything to compare with india but egypt uh, turkey the celebritization of piety is and musicians and politicians forfeiting secular careers dance you know um, uh, music etc and taking the pious path is very much um, a movement you know but um, so if we look then at the next one um, this is sort of you know more on specifically on taliban uh, masculinity there's some work on this and actually again uh, what is a little disappointing about current work is that it doesn't actually connect with the history i know it's a tough call we're not historians and we get it wrong sometimes but you know it, it, there's a disconnect if we don't link it to history now frontier masculinity since british colonial period and there's a incredible that's a whole thesis in itself right uh, the frontier was literally the boundary of certain masculinities two kinds of masculinities clashed um, it was british masculinities that was considered to be feminist feminized emasculated and pathan and pakhtun masculinities had their own bravery codes uh, honor codes etc and defiance uh, and women played a role gendered impact of that as well but i just think that you know uh, this is interesting because of the contradiction of uh, this idea in the west and amongst us of the taliban as being brute and crude and you know hyper masculine etc but you know there are moments that were caught by uh, you know in their uh, passport when they took passport photographs in kabul between 2001 and 2014 Uh, look at these portraits you know they they're soft they're feminized um there's this um, sort of secretive kind of uh, even a a sympathetic homoeroticism to it it's not it's not judgmental you know it's not about there was some literature and narrative that did that that demonized the taliban and their sexualities but not necessarily all of it you know there was also sympathetic this book by the way does extremely well in queer bookstores in berlin you know the the uh, photographer and the author of the book said so so there's this you know kind of uh, that we've um already discussed you know the kind of comparative over here um but i just wanted to move a little bit on contemporary times and this idea of who and what interrupts and what is considered to be a uh, deviant masculinity contemporary masculinity so 
the Bhutto factor that you talked about, um, this is a continuing signifier of, of masculinities. And Bilawal Bhutto, who is the grandson of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto uh, and the son of the assassinated Benazir Bhutto, he's the current co-chairperson of the People's Party, but he's routinely has been mocked for his mild mannerisms, for his liberal kind of lifestyle and ideals. He has also been emasculated by uh, Imran Khan when he was prime minister. You know, the kind of gendered insults and gendered slurs are common again between Modi, who does it to Rahul Gandhi, and Imran Khan, who does it to Bilawal Bhutto and to um, uh, Maryam Nawaz. And he mimics them, you know, I mean, it's so performative. Imran Khan, you know, this whatever 70 year old prime minister is standing on a stage and mimicking because it, you know, it is, it is part of the, the performance. Uh, and also, but Bilawal, but because of that, Bilawal is trolled by uh, masculinist hyper-nationalists online. Um, it's not about state persecution. It is about what a leader can, uh, can trigger, right? It encourages you know, trolls to, and this is exactly what women journalists say, that when a leader makes certain, takes certain stands or signals a certain kind of attitude, it encourages the nation and nationalists to become trolls and persecute and, and cast him as effeminate. And sometimes he's effeminate and gay, and sometimes he's a macho philandering, you know, sort of leader who, who is um, having relationships with other women in, in, the, in the political party. So it's amazing, you know, he can be both sexualities at the same time. Um, yeah, but you see, uh, one can also understand Imran, uh, Imran's guilt that, he, that he's developed himself for, uh, for uh, 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 leading most of his life in London and uh, not knowing much about Pakistan. And uh, we see this thing in Imran emerging from the 1990s onwards, uh, when he wants to be seen more in Shalwar Kameez, for example, and sound like this, making fun of uh, people uh, who speak well and uh, sound modest. He sees them as a threat as someone uh, he couldn't become himself. If you see Imran's career as a cricketer as, and, and as a socialite way back, he wasn't a very articulate man. He couldn't explain himself. He always first depended on his cousin Majid Khan to speak for him. And then his friend and now enemy, Safraz Nawaz, he always depended on other people to talk about him. And when he was... A, 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 asked, he himself called he's very shy and he couldn't speak much. Uh, but I don't know what was really going on inside him. But when he started to speak, when he started getting into public speech, speaking during uh, when he became a politician, I felt that there was, he's been suffering from various complexes and insecurities. And uh, this sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, what would you call it? Call it bigotry and, uh, and nonsense that he speaks about uh, 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 ridiculing Bilawal or ridiculing Mariam, it's coming from that insecurity because he's still not sure exactly how he's being uh, framed. Hmm. He's still not sure. And that's why we see him sometimes he's trying to frame himself. Sometimes he becomes a messiah. Sometimes he becomes a fatherly figure. He doesn't know. He cannot comprehend how women and his young followers are perceiving him. So he's always trying, he's always changing roles, you know. And uh, he cannot, for example, if he's criticized by a person like Bilawal, this is the only thing for him to do, is to mock him, that he sounds like his mother, that he's effeminate, you know, hmm. uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So th this is like Imran, a 70, 71 year old man who still hasn't found who re he really is. And he's, and that is creating a lot of problem because he's found it or has been aided to come in a position where whatever he says or do, can impact the whole country. But here's a 70 year old guy who's still suffering from an identity crisis. He still hasn't, doesn't know what he is. He doesn't know, he's not very confident. That's a wrong image about him that he stands up and very confident, he's not. That's why he stumbles when he speaks because he doesn't know how to present himself. Sometimes it becomes, like I said, a messianic figure. Sometimes it becomes something else. Then when he sort of starts to wonder what he's saying, then he starts talking about cricket. That's the only thing he's sure about. Mm -hmm. The other thing he's sure about, he doesn't speak about anymore, of course, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that's what's happening to him. And that is why he ends up 
uh, doing these things, uh, calling Maria Nawaz, who is about 30 years younger than her, than him, uh, a, a grandmother, hmm. or Bilawal Bhutto, who's about 40 to 50 years younger than him, or let's say 30, 40 years younger. You know, he's in his early 30s, uh, mocking him as a, as, as a gay man or, or as, 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 yeah, as a woman, really, in a man's body. So it is the so, same you know, about an unstable masculinity and an anxious masculinity. Um, that's it. Yeah. So, but I do want to just quickly now turn to the, the to the you know deviant masculinities, which I argue is the way to challenge these uh, other dominant or hegemonic masculinities. Um, this is the other grandson of uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, um, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto Jr who is uh, also brother to Fatma Bhutto. He's a queer artist and is a performer who used to be based in San Francisco and I think uh, in Pakistan back and forth. He's, uh, uh, you know, in opposition to what you've said, he's actually very articulate, extremely articulate about yeah. physical and sexual masculinities. He's done some work on it, some really fascinating work on how Arnold Schwarzenegger is on the cover of a lot of um, um, magazines in Pakistan on the footpaths and, and sort of posters of him in, in he's sort of the ideal of muscle building, the, mus the muscle man, Musliman who uh, he talks about. It's a really interesting essay. And he embodies a lot of the themes that I discuss. And his feminizing, the, the fabrics that he uses in his art are sort of feminizing the, the discourse, the art discourse, um, and showing the fragility of masculinities that we pose with, etc. So it's a really thoughtful um, de dealing with, with masculinities. And I think um, something to watch out for. It's not his politics that you need to watch. To his, so his mainstream politics is not the issue. His artistic sensibilities and what he brings and what he interrupts in the legacy of, of the Bhutto. And the fact that we have both the grandsons um, you know, on the scene, as it were, uh, is an interesting book ending of the theme. Um, this also, I've, you know, we've already discussed. Um, I, I think Fasi Zaka wrote a wrote a piece in the newspaper on TikTok masculinities, right? And really the interesting part is only that these are subaltern masculinities, right? They're the common man, the working class man, um, and they talk about their aspiration. And, you know, just to go back, if you remember, um, Nadeem, you remember the, the TV drama, Angan Teda, um, hmm. which, uh, which staged deviant masculinities in the in the ascetic General Ziaullah 1980s, right? Um, and then later we had the TV talk show with this and cross-dressing uh, with Nawazish, Nawazish, yeah. uh, with Ali Salim, sort of reflecting the kind of liberalization of sexual politics in the new millennium under General Musharraf's period. You know? um, so like I said, it's not a coincidence that leadership sort of opens and encourages different kinds of um, yeah, performances. And, um, you know, so even, um, and then we had okay. some comments. Sorry, go ahead. I was just, I wanted to say, do you think it's also because I, because I was going back to the, uh, those images of Pashtun men in Afghanistan, uh, the passport uh, photographs with the makeup on and all. Do you think it also happens because, or, or this happens because, uh, because of lack of women in the public space, lack of uh, interaction between uh, men and women who are not yeah. husband or wife or, or sister or brother? Yeah, I think it's a common question, but you know, there is this theory about suppressed sexuality or suppression or, or severe gender apartheid where you're not allowed to, but you know, I'm hesitant to, to, to position it like that because that suggests that there cannot be other sexualities. And this is the only reason that, you know, heterosexual relationships are not allowed. Therefore we succumb to women. And that's, you know, a, a debunked, debunked uh, theory and understanding. Uh, desire is inexplicable. Desire doesn't have to have logic, you know. Um, and but the only argument we make as feminists is that it is not the business of the state or about political ideology to direct us, to force us, to make us conform to some ideal of masculinity, like you said, whether it is Muslim or Indian or conservative. Uh, we should not have to subscribe or ascribe to any gendered roles that are decided by someone other than ourselves, right? No, I, I say this because I remember uh, 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 someone, a writer, a, a woman, uh, uh, she once commented that she was, uh, she's been in Pakistan for quite a while and she studied abroad and she just tweeted something like that 
all the years she's been in Pakistan, she's just seen men dancing on television and she's hardly seen any woman or women dancing in functions either, and especially in public spaces or, or, or in mediums which are uh, open to public. She said that all 90% of the time, she's just seen men dance. Yeah. So this, you know? yeah, that's a, that's a separate point. I mean, it's an interesting point because Fassi says that on TikTok, all the time, most of the time, what these men are doing are dancing. So I'm not sure whether, mm-hmm. you know, women on TikTok are dancing, but you know that, again, the state is involved in this, that when the state bans women's performances at a certain time. It takes a very, see the problem with the Imran Khan syndrome is it's going to take a very long time to come back from a position of gender apartheid when public services are, or public spaces are exclusively for men, when you victim blame women, when you say you should not be on the streets at 12 o'clock, it's dangerous for you. When you start putting the burden on, on women and not giving them equal access and equal space, whether it is in political forums, whether it is in public space, whether it is as journalists, and you troll them, you mock them, uh, you undermine them, and you sort of demean their femininity instead of giving it equality. Of course, this backlash is going to happen, and public spaces are reserved only for, for men in that sense. But, uh, but that is changing and will change only, uh, only with resistance. Right? There is just no other way for it. We cannot wait for a paternalistic state or a general musharraf to come and make those spaces for us. We have to fight for those spaces all the time. And certainly what the Aurat March represents is exactly yeah. that. Fighting for the, it doesn't have to have, um, you know, an end always. It doesn't have to make sense to you. It is expanding public spaces. And that is an agenda in itself, right? Um, right. So, so yes, I think that, you know, um, these TikTok masculinities are interesting. They do repeat some of the themes of nationalism and patriotism. You can see the horse, yeah. the horse is there. The horse and the flag. <laughs> and the flag is there, the flag. and yeah. stand with Kashmir, and and the Ferrari is there. You know, the new liberal agenda is there as well. So I think it's in yeah. commentary on subaltern masculinities. And then I just want to sort of end on the last slide, which I think just brings us back and summarizes the hegemonic masculinities uh, that I mentioned with regard to Pakistan, the military. Uh, the left image is sort of disjointed now a bit. Uh, you know, there's an interesting split that's happened over there. But at yeah. that time, there was a this hybrid civil military regime nonsense. Um, the money trope is, of course, represented by the land developer Malik Riaz. I have always argued that he's the real owner of Pakistan, you know, and the real leader in that sense, the influencer. Um, and uh, at the and you know this collusion with state elites. That's that's the important thing. Um, and you can see the Eiffel Tower at the back, which denotes a very middle class aspiration, right? It's either Dubai. Yeah, yeah. Or it's a voyeuristic travel, like the TikTok masculinities, not, not too different from that. Um, but, um, but and then at the bottom, we've got the role of clerics or Molvies, uh, the Tablighi proselytizer, and their celebrities now, celebrity uh, cleric, also a long way from the Maududian sort of model. Yeah. Um, and he um, moralizes all the time. Again, women are the linchpin. Women's immodesty is the main issue with them. And he has now an upmarket branded clothing business. So capitalism money is not far behind in any of these ways. Um, and you and I know that, you know, the, the, we were talking about public spaces, but capitalist sites of, for example, multiplex cinemas in Pakistan or gymnasiums or branded clothes or that, you know, the Amir Liaquat piety game shows on TV, on, on Geo. And we have Islamic portals, we have YouTube, uh, Tabliris um, shows. They are all engineered to the benefit of pious and military and political and capitalist masculinities in Pakistan today, right? Um, and I think, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to end it on a, on a depressing note, but the fact is that, uh, you know, I feel that uh, civil society in India and Pakistan is currently quite defeated by the piety discourse, actually. Um, you know, it mutes, like I said, it mutes our critical skills. It mutes questioning, skepticism, accountability. And what all these factors do is they serve patriarchy. You know, that's the important thing for me. It's fine for us to uh, devote our research and uh, academic and political energies to say we want to understand uh, subjectivities um, and pretend that this is all for feminist interests or it's so interesting. I mean, fine, it's interesting. But just don't claim then 
as kind of a radical or left or orthodox Marxist or even a feminist position. You know, these labels are meaningless then. Um, it dilutes the direction of a radical politics. It, um, you know, um, what the previous generation did, you're losing the thread and the connectivity with their resistance by, by be, being seduced by this piety and seduced by, and blaming everything on the state and denying, it's not even good analysis because it denies societal. I mean, Imran Khan is today a viable, legitimate populist. You know, we don't have to like it. We can be critical of it, but we have to quit pretending that the state is, you know, I mean, he's, he's the biggest voice against the state today. And, and it's not easy to do that, right? Um, wherever it's coming from and whatever purpose. So the question for me then is where has the politics of piety ended? You know, and it's today with Imran Khan and Bushra and Khan. This whole idea of don't talk about her and don't and it's private and all the rest of it. They are the quintessential definition of piety politics and all the combination of Imran's populism uh, congeals patriarchy and his followers and the celebrities, they all take their cue from his leadership um, and gendered bigotry and chauvinism. And so we can expect this to flow much more. This is the exact pattern we see in Egypt and Turkey, celebrities, you know, abandoning their careers, turning to piety politics. This is real politics. And when it converts into votes for Modi and Imran, we should not act surprised. We cannot wonder where these votes are coming from or how did this happen. Piety is the B, the B team of religious politics. It boosts, it stabilizes patriarchy, uh, and it resists feminist transformation. It may give a little bit of empowerment, but it's not going to give you transformation. And um, you know, the stabilizing of masculinities, the stabilizing of patriarchies, um, is something that uh, is you know we need to be more clear about it, and we need to have an agenda uh, about it. I also forgot to mention for a while in terms of populism, um, you remember Major General Ghafoor's uh, 15 minutes of glory as uh, the ISPR Twitter, he handled the ISPR's Twitter handle, uh, you know, for a while. Um, I think, you know, Imran Khan has managed to even wipe out that competition. You know, I mean, Ghafoor, mm -hmm. he, like, you know, he was like the Pope because all these people adulating followers, uh, he used to say, bless you, beta, bless you, you know, whatever, like, like Pakistan's Pope, you know, he had incredible following to it. Uh, maybe the army should have continued to have him, you know, um, uh, to compete with Imran today. They lost that opportunity, I think. But, you know, these... Well, are... I, I think Afur Saab uh, started competing with the general himself. I uh, think that, that created an issue. <laughs> so they have to, you, everybody has to stay in their lane, you know, this is something... Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I'm not pretending that Imran Khan is interested in disinvesting uh, the, the, the army, you know, or disinvesting politics from the army. It's just that uh, right now we're paying for the price of the clash of male egos. That's what's happening on the, on the stage today. And uh, the division of women's loyalty worries me tremendously on this misplaced patriotism, fake patriotism, abstract patriotism, you know. Um, Patriotism is fake, it's abstract, just like piety is. It's flag waving, it's dharnas, it's grand narrative, it's na nare bazi, you know. Um, and although Imran Khan, I think, has become an independent leader for the first time, uh, precisely because he's become a victim. You know, you have to be a victim in Pakistan to be a true leader. Um, and usually it's, um, even if it's fictionalized, you know, um, but that is the condition of, of Pakistani political leadership. And unfortunately, bravery is, reduced to who you call out on, on these public forums, not what you do, you know. But, but that's what we have as our resistance today, and we need to have a serious political agenda that civil society and progressives can, how do we take advantage of this, you know, what, how do we push our agenda, which is far more substantive and transformative, and not just in our interest, but the people's interest, you know, how do we convert that? I guess that's, that's my main concern. So, Mariam, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Zia. Thank you, Varasha Saab. Uh, it was a, an, a very interesting discussion. And uh, I recently read uh, your paper, Dr. Zia, uh, and I was fascinated by uh, how you compared both the regimes, uh, the Modi and uh, Imran Khan regime, and the fact that they happened simultaneously at the same time, you know, during, during similar um, geopolitical situations was fascinating. However, what I um, did not 
find in the paper and would, would love to you know, have your comments about is, is um, the role of uh, social class when we talk about how we understand um, uh, populist politics and uh, piety and uh, you know, um, even hyper-masculinity. Um, there is a little bit of uh, discussion around social class when we talk about subaltern uh, masculinities and TikTok, but we do not talk about um, the other end of it, you know, the the more um, weaponized masculinity uh, all across social classes, not, mm -hmm. not just lower social economic classes. So um, either of you, uh, uh, at this question, I'm throwing it uh, at both of you. Mm -hmm. So what are your comments um, about that? And um, why uh, do you think um, a discu this discussion uh, does not include you know, a comment in social class as well. Uh, I mean, I think that's a great question because um, class is a big question, right? Um, and so it's past, it's only in reference, it's, pa it's in passing reference that, you know, I, I discuss it. But uh, the, the comparative is a little bit difficult, Mariam, because uh, it's not just class, you know, in India, caste becomes extremely important and masculinities are extremely, extremely divided. And um, that's a whole different dynamics, right? So that's why I, I looked only at Modi's uh, policies with regard to Muslim men, you know, because that's a certain that's a certain uh, kind of religious and, and the pietist project comes over there. But of course, Brahminical masculinity. There's been a lot of work done on that, right? Um, Brahminical masculinity, how that's the standard and what it does to all other uh, masculinities, how it uh, feminizes uh, the lower caste. And, and particularly Ambedkar, and, and there's a lot of work on that in India. It's hard to do the comparison. In Pakistan, unfortunately, there's far less work on, um, on this notion of uh, masculinities across the classes. Um, but, uh, but I think that um, we, we tend to then therefore see it in terms of um, the drivers are, uh, you know, working class masculinities uh, tends to be associated with far more with labor, but like you say, that there is, we see it from the lens of, of violence, right? And violence cuts across uh, all, there's no one class that completely dominates the masculinist discourse in Pakistan, right? Um, there's been work done by Rubina Segal and Sabah Gul Khattar on how the Pakistani state has been defined as masculinist in itself, right? Really interesting work on foreign policy. Sabah's work has been on foreign policy and the kind of language that defines it. And their finding has been, Mariam, that much of it has been India-centric. Like we take our cues from how the Indian state defines its state identity. And therefore, our, our, uh, we cut our teeth, um, you know, and our gender identity against it. I mean, it, it, and this was done in the 1990s. Some of the best feminist literature comes from there. Um, yes, it's not, there's not been enough work on it. Nadeem, agar aap, if I may interject, I think Sabagul Khatak is also present in the webinar. She she would you know want to bring yes. in, so she can talk more about that actually. All right. Um, if with your permission, if uh, you allow, may I op open the floor for questions? I think we have a hand raised. अच्छा सबसे पहले तो मैं पूछना चाहूँगा आफिया साहब से और नदीम साहब से अगर मैं उर्दू में बात कर लूँ तो कोई मुजाइका तो नहीं है इसमें. बिल्कुल भी नहीं. चलिए बहुत शुक्रिया. अच्छा आपने माशाल्लाह बहुत अच्छा कवर किया मतलब एक इस मौजू को और जो उसके अंदर जिस किस्म का टॉक्सिक एलिमेंट है उसको बहुत अच्छे तरीके से आपने बताया और कुछ हिस्ट्री भी बताई मेरा थोड़ा सा डिफरेंट टेक है डेफिनेटली हम बात एक अफेक्ट की कर रहे हैं और उसके कॉजेज समझने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं जो आप सामने लेकर आए हैं कि ये अफेक्ट है और ये उसके कॉजेज हैं अगर देखा जाए तो हम एक जिसे कहना चाहिए इंतबी जमहूरीत की बात कर रहे हैं जो कि एक सरमायेदाराना माशरे में है और अगर ये देखा जाए तो ये इंतबी जमहूरीत को भी समझना ज़रूरी है और सरमायादाराना माशरे को भी समझना ज़रूरी है तो जो इंतबी जमहूरीत है जिसके अंदर हम जिसे कहते हैं अडल फ्रेंचाइज या यूनिवर्सल सफरेज की बात करते हैं तो वो भी आपको इल्म है कि वो बीसवीं सदी की देन है और जिसमें औरतों को सबसे ज़्यादा सबसे बाद में मतलब है जाके राइट्स मिलें और वो राइट्स भी मर्दों ने ही दिए हैं तो इट मीन्स के मर्दों की जो सुप्रॉरिटी थी या मोनोपली थी ऑन डिसकोर्स वो शुरू से कायम थी और हम अब इस रीजंस पे नहीं जा रहे कि उन मर्दों ने औरतों को क्यों लेकर आए या क्यों दिए उसके मुख्तलिफ वजूहत हैं 
لیکن بہرحال ایک سرمایہ دارانہ جمہوریت کے اندر آپ کو بھی اچھی طرح سے علم ہے کہ جو طاقت کی کشمکش ہے وہ اشرافیہ کے مختلف گروپوں میں ہوتی ہے اور جس قسم کی انتخابی جمہوریت ہے اس میں وہی اشرافیہ کے گروپس آئیں گے جو طاقتور ہوں گے اب چاہے وہ طاقتور گروپ ظاہری بات ہے جو ایک بڑی تعداد ہے ہیپ نوٹس کی انہی کے نام پہ سیاست کریں گے اور چاہے وہ ان کو مذہب کے نام پہ لیور کریں چاہے وہ ان کو کلاس کے نام پہ لیور کریں یہی ہم نے دیکھا ہے نارملی کے کلاس اور یہ بھی آپ کو اچھی طرح علم ہے کہ سرمایہ دارانہ جمہوریت کے اندر یا سرمایہ دارانہ نظام میں عدم مساوات جو ہے وہ ایک حقیقت ہے کہ یو ہیو اے لاٹ آف ان اکویلٹی ان دا سسٹم جو کہ کوشش کی گئی ہمارے لیفٹ کے لوگوں نے جو سوشل ڈیموکریسی وغیرہ پہ یا اس پہ جیسے ہم کہہ رہے ہیں پچاس ساٹھ کے اشرے میں جب کنیشن اکنامکس وغیرہ تھی یا لیفٹ کا تھوڑا سا دور دورہ تھا تو تاکہ اور جہاں کمیونزم کو بھی روکنا تھا تو ویلفیئر اسٹیٹ کا اور ان چیزوں کا لیکن آپ کو پتا ہے کہ ستر کے اشرے کے بعد بعد یہ چیز سسٹینیبل نہیں رہی اور اس کے بعد ریگن صاحب کا وقت آ گیا اس کے بعد ہم نے آگے دیکھا تھیچر وغیرہ کا اور ان کا ٹائم آیا نیو لبرلز اوپر آ کہ بھیا اس طرح نہیں چلے گا سسٹم ان اکویلٹی چاہیے ہے ہمیں ترقی کرنے کے لیے ہم غریبوں کا بوجھ نہیں اٹھا سکتے اب غریبوں کو بھی کسی ٹرکی بتی کے پیچھے لگانا تھا تو غریبوں کو لگا دیا گیا بنیادی طور پہ رائٹس پہ وہ جو آئیڈینٹی پالیٹکس جیسے ہم کہتے ہیں شناخت کی سیاست اس کے اندر مطلب ہے کہ انہیں لگایا گیا شناخت کی سیاست کے اندر جو کہ ہمیں نیو لبرلزم کے ساتھ بہت تیزی سے ابھرتی ہوئی نظر آئی ہے اس کے شاخسانے آپ دیکھیں کہ جہاں سے وہ ڈسمینٹل ہو رہا ہے لیفٹ کا ڈسکورس وہاں سے اسی کے اشرے میں یہ ابھر رہا ہے اور پھر ہم یہ دیکھ رہے ہیں کہ ایون جو لیفٹ کے بھی لوگ ہیں انہوں نے بھی سروائیو کرنے کے لیے اس کے بہت سارے ایلیمنٹس جو ہیں وہ اڈاپٹ بھی کر لیے اور وہ چیزیں چل رہی ہیں اور جو چیزیں اب ہم دیکھ رہے ہیں پاکستان میں جس طرح آپ نے ذکر کیا عمران خان کا جو تضادات ہیں اور جو اس کو لوگ سپورٹ کر رہے ہیں ان کے تضادات ہیں اور یہ تضادات صرف عمران خان کے نہیں ساتھ جیسے عافیہ صاحبہ نے ذکر کیا ہندوستان میں بھی ہیں اور باقی ملکوں میں بھی ہیں کہ وہ خود ایلیٹ کلاس ہے وہ ایلیٹ کلاس ہی ایلیٹ کلاس کو گالیاں نکال رہی ٹھیک ہے اور سمجھ رہی ہے کہ جی کہ ہم اور اس کو ایک ٹریکشن بھی مل رہا ہے تو یہ جو ایک سسٹم کی جو ڈکاٹمی ہے وہ سسٹم میں ان لوگوں کو بینیفٹ بھی دے رہی ہے اور انہوں نے پولیٹیکلی ریلیونٹ بھی رہنا ہے اب پولیٹیکل ریلیونٹ رہنے کے لیے جو منافقت ہے وہ میرا خیال ہے نیم آف دا گیم ہے جو کہ ہمیں ختم ہوتا ہوا نظر نہیں آ رہا مطلب میں جہاں تک سمجھ رہا ہوں ختم ہوتا ہوا نظر نہیں آ رہا پرائیویٹلی لوگ کچھ اور کرتے ہیں پبلکلی آ کے کچھ اور بات کرتے ہیں یہ ہم نے ہر جگہ پہ دیکھا ہے مطلب ہے کہ آپ یہ دیکھ لیں کہ پرائیویٹ ان کے فارم ہاؤسز میں آپ بھی آپ کو بھی موقع ملا ہوگا وہاں ایک بالکل علیحدہ ماحول ہوتا ہے لیکن باہر آ کے وہ ایک دوسرا لبادہ اڑ لیتے ہیں کیونکہ انہوں نے ان ہیو ناٹس کو ایک او پی ایم بھی دینا ہوتا ہے ایک وہ بھی دینا ہوتا ہے تو یہ جو ٹاکسک جو آپ بات کر رہے ہیں مسکولینٹی کی بات کر رہے ہیں یہ بنیادی طور پہ اشرافیہ کا ایک ہتھیار ہے کہ اس ہتھیار سے انہوں نے اپنی طاقت کو پرپیچویٹ کرنا ہے اور جہاں تک مجھے سمجھ میں آ رہی ہے می بی آئی ایم رو ہمیں یہ چیز ختم ہوتے ہوئے نظر نہیں آ رہی اس انتخابی جمہوریت کے حساب میں اور اس سرمایہ دارانہ معاشرے کے حساب سے شکریہ تھینک یو آئی تھنک یو نو زیادہ تر جو چیزیں کہی ہیں اس میں کوئی مجھے اختلاف نہیں ہے اس سے صرف یہ ہے کہ میں میرا یہ کہنا اور میری یہ تجویز یہ ہے کہ ہم ونڈوز آف اپرچونیٹیز ہی دیکھتے ہیں نا ایز فیمنسٹ ود ان دا میسکولن ڈسکورس ہم دیکھتے ہیں کہ کون سی اپرچونیٹی ہے آئی ڈونٹ اگری کہ عورتوں کو حقوق دیے گئے ہیں آئی مین وہ جد و جہد چلی تھی بہت عرصے سے چلتی سفریجیٹ موومنٹس ہر جگہ چلی تھی تو وہ چھین کے لینی پڑتی ہیں حقوق کو دیتا نہیں ہے خاص طور پہ تو مرد نہیں دیتے ہیں یو نو وہ گارڈ کرتے ہیں اس کو اینڈ میسکولنیٹی ایک ٹول ہے ایک آلہ ہے جس سے آپ اس کو سیل کر دیتے ہیں قدر کرتے ہیں لیکن ونڈو آف اپرچونیٹی سے میرا مقصد کہنے کا یہ ہے کہ کل پرسوں جو الیکشنز ہوئی ہیں کراچی میں آئی مین ایم کیو ایم کو توڑنا کوئی آسان چیز نہیں ہے کوئی مذاق نہیں یو نو اینڈ اس کی بہت سی میکنیشنز ہو سکتی ہیں آل ایم سینگ از کہ باوجود اس کے جو ساری کرٹیک ہم کر رہے ہیں عمران خان کی اور اس کی میسکولنٹی کی اور اس کی بگٹیڈ پالیٹکس کی اور اس کی پائٹس پاپولزم کی کین وی ناٹ سیپریٹ دس اینڈ تھوڑا ہٹ کے اینالیٹکلی اس کو دیکھیں کہ بھائی کون سی یہ بات ہے کون سی یہ انگریڈینٹ ہے جو اس چیز پہ توڑ بن گئی ہے سولین سپریمسی کے لیے ہمیں کیا کرنے کی ضرورت ہے ایم کیو ایم کی ہیجمنی
वो करें उससे मैस्कुलिनिटी की अलग चीज है येस इट विल ऑलवेज नथिंग इज गोइंग टू बी यू नो सर गिवन टू यू ये तो हमें अपना एक कॉन्स्टेंटली नया एजेंडा नए तरीके कार नई अनालिसिस निकालने की जरूरत है कलेक्टिव ऑल्टरनेटिव पॉलिटिक्स जैसे आप कह रहे हैं अब सरमायादारी निजाम का तो मैं कुछ नहीं कर सकती हूँ अनफॉर्चुनेटली आई यू नो रिपीटेडली फील डिफीटेड बाई दिस खसूस जब हम देखते हैं कि वर्किंग क्लासेस जो है वो उनका उनका आला सिर्फ मजहब ही रह गया है एंड यू नो इट्स वेरी हार्ड टू रिवाइव क्लास कॉन्शियसनेस एंड आई थिंक पार्टी डज अपर्ब जॉब ऑफ डिफ्लेक्टिंग द नीड फॉर द हार्ड वर्क ऑफ मोबिलाइजिंग ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ क्लास पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ क्लास आइडियोलॉजी या क्लास आइडेंटिटी क्लास आइडेंटिटी को कैसे वापस लेके आना आई डोंट हैव इजी आंसर्स फॉर इट बट सर्टनली दैट डजेंट मीन के वी सकम और गिव अप और सरेंडर टू पार्टी और मैस्कुलिनिटी और टू द फोर्ज और अदर थिंग वी कैन फाइंड अदर वेज ऑफ ऑफ इंस्ट्रूमेंटलाइजिंग अपॉर्चुनिटी नदीम हां नहीं जैसे आई जस्ट वांट टू ऐड के अगर جمہوریت کی اپ ہسٹری پڑھیں تو صرف عورتوں کو نہیں काफी uh, वो लोग जो एरिस्टोक्रेसी का पार्ट भी थे जिनके पास लैंड एंड का हिस्सा नहीं थे उनको भी वोट की इजाजत नहीं थी वो भी बाद में मिली और ट्वेंटी सेंचुरी तक आते ही मिलते आगे और ये वर्किंग क्लासेस को भी राइट्स uh, वोट के बाद में मिले uh, तो वो सिर्फ सिर्फ औरतों में महदूद नहीं थी और मैं आपकी ऐसे बिल्कुल अग्री करता हूँ कि वो राइट लेने के लिए उसके लिए बहुत बड़ी जिदोजहद और इसी किस्म की जिदोजहद इवन दो पाकिस्तान में राइट्स थे वे मिल गए आपने देखा विमेंस एक्शन फोरम ने डिक्टेटरशिप के खिलाफ जियालत के खिलाफ इट वॉज दिमेन एक्चुअली बिलोंग टू फोरम्स लाइक द वैफ जिन्होंने बहुत जबरदस्त दे वर एट द फोर्स अगेंस्ट दैट वेरी रिप्रेसिव डिक्टेटरशिप टू वर्स यूजिंग पायटी एंड कॉन्सेप्ट टू टू कंसोलिडेट पार एक और दिलचस्प चीज है नदी ये मोदी का तो अशाफिया से कोई ताल्लुक नहीं है ना आई मीन उनकी तो उनकी तो द ब्यूटी ऑफ दिस पॉपुलरिज्म इज कि वो अशाफिया से उसका ताल्लुक नहीं है लेकिन आई एम नॉट सेइंग कि ब्राह्मण इशू नहीं है मगर आई एम सेइंग अशाफिया का सर्कल नहीं है एंड इवन इन इंडिया उधर की विमेन एक्टिविस्ट हैं विमेन जर्नलिस्ट हैं फिल्म मेकर्स हैं औरतें हैं शाहीन बाग में जो जमा हुई थी जो कि एक सिविल और एक सेक्युलर स्टेट के लिए जदोजहद उधर भी कर रही है उनकी रेजिस्टेंस उधर से आ रही है चाहे वो कश्मीर में हो या यू नो अदर पार्ट्स ऑफ इंडिया में हो तो वो रेजिस्टेंस यू नो उसका ताल्लुक यू नो मैस्कुलिनिटी से है यू नो इट डजेंट मैटर विच क्लास यू बिलोंग टू अगर आपकी पॉलिटिक्स पेट्रियाकल है और जेनोसाइडल है और जेनोफोबिक है और बिगटेड है तो चाहे आपका ताल्लुक किसी भी तबके से हो फॉर फेमिनिस यू नो दैट दैट इज एन इंटरसेक्शन इट इज नॉट दी ओनली सिंगल लेंस से तो नहीं देखते so the ashrafia concept has a limited uh, usefulness for uh, for understand because uska jod jamhuriyat ke sath jamhuriyat ke sath hamesha ke liye zaruri nahi i don't you know that is the thing about populism to lekin ek zamane mein for example uh, ye samjha jata tha west ke andar bhi samjha jata tha before the 1970s i would say ke jahan jo padhi likhi urbanized middle classes hoti hain wo इनहेरेंटली डेमोक्रेटिक हो जाती है इनहेरेंटली लिबरल हो जाती है बट सीन दिस होल आइडिया हमने देखा दिस इज नॉट द केस जब भी मैं वो सवाल भी तो आप ही से पहले पूछ रहा था ना कि इसको क्या क्या है कि इमरान खान जैसे ऐसा शख्स जो यू नो मैस्कुल पार्टी वाली पॉलिटिक्स करता है उसको भी बड़ी यही मिडिल क्लास पढ़ी लिखी lifestyle liberals follow karte hain so i don't think it's got to do with class as such it is it is like afia said as a society patriarchal to ye cheez to across the class mein milegi aapko and uh, isme jamhuriyat bechari ko waisa kuch uh, wo hai nahi the <laughs> suit uh, we are what uh, what is usually called uh, and still a illiberal democracy uh, which has risen in various uh, countries especially in developing countries jahan ek to socha gaya tha ki jab communism fall hua uske baad ab jahan bhi dictatorships thi ye aur developing countries asia tak ye sab liberal democracies ban gaye the ha dictatorships wahan kam to ho gayi but then we had the authoritarian people uh, coming up and uh, being elected or apparently elected so they all turned into illiberal democracies and there were all over the now we see these populists coming up but this first century populists chahe wo india bhi ho 
जो एक जमान में कह सकते थे समहाउ लिबरल डेमोक्रेसी बट इट्स टेकन एल लिबरल टर्म देयर एज वेल सो बड़ी कॉम्प्लेक्स रीजंस हैं हम ओके um i think dr mariam musan had some power cut issues um so i'll we'll take it up from here thank you so much dr afia thank you so much mr nadeem paracha uh, i can see among the attendees the uh, tuba sayed and uh, dr sabagul khatak um tuba do you want to comment or do you want to share anything and also to dr sabagul khatak please thank you very much um to dr afia and nadeem paracha um this has definitely been you know a very enlightening enlightening for me um and i do agree with a lot of what they've put forward in terms of you know how these masculinities have been operational operationalized um in a way that hame jis tarah you know nazar aata hai ki jahan imran khan ka comparison bhi afia draw karti hai usme i think ek aur bhi bahut interesting baat hai ki jo मिडल क्लास खातन की जो एक आइडलाइज मेस्कुलटी थी उसको भी कहीं ना कहीं जो कि एक मिलिट्री की मेस्कुलटी होती थी कि हर एक को एक फौजी अफसर एक आम औरत को चाहिए होता था कि उससे शादी हो जाए या मिल जाए आई थिंक इमरान खान ने कहीं ना कहीं उसको भी आके रिप्लेस किया एंड दैट आई फाइंड वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग क्योंकि अब औरतों को जिन औरतों के साथ यू नो यंगर वुमेन आई इंगेज हुए um i also see that they idolize a 70 year old man uh which i don't think ever ever happened before it was usually the younger captains and majors jo ke idolize hote the to ek to all i really have to add that this is uh, you know a very a good intervention which both of you have made and i am really thankful uh, for both of you for sharing this knowledge with us and uh, yeah uh, overall i definitely really commend everything you've shared with us so thank you very much for that so tuba you just given general bajwa a new reason to be anxious <laughs> <laughs> now us are 30 35 years ke majors ko aage karenge but anyway yes i think you know yeah for me it is fascinating of course it is not uh, you know i don't think we can draw away the sexuality part or the sexual appeal of imran khan from this and why should we shy away from it you know but it is fascinating that uh, on one level the same liberals i mean i'm i'm mest sirf middle class ki baat nahi kar rahi hu mujhe zyada interest aur aur masla upar le tabke se ya shafia se unki jo adulation hai wo jawan hai 30s mein hai and they admire him and find him you know attractive still and they will be the same ones jo ke kal agar child marriage kahi ho jati hai ya relationships mein bahut gap hoti hai saalon ki us pe to bahut tanqeed kare right but they can have so you know what my only appeal to all of us is to understand that desire doesn't know age and you know appeal and sexuality is a very fluid very fluid commodity it you can't stick it on one and say ki bas aise hi hona chahiye koi kanoon se theek nahi ho jati hai ya um, you know critique se uh, it, itna aasan nahi hai logon ka you know nazariya badalna um, and and especially when it's emotional and it's emotive um, so i think you know not just imran khan but look at amir liaquat and all of these you know men who um, strut a certain kind of confidence um, and 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 command public space and services and sexualize themselves they have no problem as men ki apni sexuality ko foreground kare as women hum chupati hain hum dhakti hain pushida rehti hain as ab sari politicians ko dekhe women politicians wo sara waqt apne aap ko dhakri hoti hain ya apologizing for their physicality and these men struck it they perform it they own it um and they showcase it and instrumentalize it apne mafad ke um so there is completely different standards uh, and that is the masculine discourse that puts women at a disadvantage hum ye keh na sirf tabqati disadvantage hai but uh, ye to straight forward is a political disadvantage to women you know i'm not saying women should do that feminists should do that but i'm just saying that everything is an unequal playing field a level playing field nahi hai na piety na uh, performativity na sexuality na masculinity and femininity so for her uh, if there are no more questions or comments so we can wrap up mm. yeah yeah we can uh, we can wrap up um any final thoughts any final um points to share or any um thing to build on the same paper as per as future research introspection is concerned um do you have any plans to would take it up uh, a notch higher maybe or some unexplored uh, research questions that you still want to 
uh, dig deep into uh, along the same topic. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm you know, this is the, I have limits of my uh, understanding and, and knowledge. I'm not a historian. I think historian historically, जो मैंने देखी है बहुत दिलचस्प चीजें निकली हैं और मुस्लिम मैस्कुलिनिटीज मोगल पीरियड में फिर 1920s में हिंदू एंड मुस्लिम राइबल मैस्कुलिनिटी बहुत दिलचस्प चीजें और बहुत सा काम भी हुआ मैं इसके ऊपर पोस्ट कोलोनियल पाकिस्तान में आई थिंक दर्ज अ लॉट ऑफ स्कोप फॉर रिसर्च ये जो है जिमनेजियम्स में किस किस्म की मैस्कुलिनिटी फिजिकल मैस्कुलिनिटी फौज के अंदर थोड़ा सा काम हुआ हुआ है कि उनकी मैस्कुलिनिटी कैसे बिल्ड की जाती है वगैरह तो काम और मौका तो बहुत है यू नो फॉर फॉर यंगर स्कॉलर्स टू पिक अप एनी थ्रेड एंड एंड टू फिल दैट इन बट बट आई ओनली लुक एट पोलिटिकल मैस्कुलिटी आई थिंक रिलीजियस मैस्कुलिनिटीज एंड दूसरी फॉर्म्स ऑफ मैस्कुलिनिटी पे काम करने की जरूरत भी है और एंड हाउ द क्लैश एंड कॉन्ट्रोडिक जैसे जिया कह रहे थे उसमें भी गुंजाइश है कि आई मीन द लॉट्स ऑफ डिफरेंट एंगल्स देर इज नो एंड टू द काइंड ऑफ रिसर्च क्वेश्चन दैट कैन कम आउट ऑफ ऑफ वेरियस लाइक दिस जिया हैज अ पॉइंट टू मेक कहिए अब मैं मैं एक बात कह रहा हूं इट्स वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग आप औरतों के बारे में बात कह रही हैं मेरा थोड़ा सा जो फोकस है वो है जी पॉवर्टी एलिवेशन पे तो मैं काम कर रहा हूं इस्लामाबाद के जैसे रेडी मानो पे तो आप भी ट्रैवल करती रही हैं हम भी ट्रैवल करते रहे हैं बाहर तो एक जो पाकिस्तान में जैसे मैंने अभी इस्लामाबाद की चार मार्केट्स में हमने कुछ लोगों को एक उसमें लेकर आए स्कीम में लेकर आए सरकार की और उनको वेंडिंग लाइसेंस वगैरह दिए तो आप यकीन करें कि ढाई सौ लोगों में से सिर्फ दो औरतें हैं और दोनों बेवाएं हैं मतलब ये जो काम कर रही थी अब मैं अफ्रीका भी गया हूँ मैं एशिया में भी गया हूँ अब वहाँ जो एवरेज औरतों की तादाद है अब हम बात कर रहे हैं लोअर क्लास की जी मेरे लिए तो टारगेट वो लोअर क्लास की औरतें कि उनकी इमेनसपेशन कैसे हो ठीक है जी तो अगर आप लोअर क्लास को देखते हैं तो 30 से 35 फीसद औरतें जो हैं वेंडिंग कर रही हैं नीचे की तरफ अब आप अच्छी तरह इस चीज़ को समझती हैं कि वेंडिंग करना आसान काम नहीं है ये सबसे मुश्किल पेशा है काम करने के हिसाब से कि जहाँ मर्दों के लिए जिंदगी जहनुम होती है तो औरतों को किस किस मुश्किल का सामना करना होता है तो वट आई एम लुकिंग एट कि हम पाकिस्तान के अगर पैराई में बात करते हैं कि जहाँ मतलब टॉक्सिक मिक्सकुलटी बहुत ज़्यादा है औरतों पे बहुत ज़्यादा दबाव है चीज़ें हैं तो इसमें जो औरतों की जैसे वुमेन एक्शन फोरम की बात की गई मुख्तलिफ और मतलब मैं उनके काम से और उनकी चीज़ों को मतलब है उनका मोतरफ हूँ मतलब मैं कतई ये नहीं समझता कि उन्होंने बहुत अच्छा काम किया कि लेकिन जो हमारा लोअर क्लास है औरतों का जिनको मेरे ख्याल सबसे ज्यादा जरूरत है जैसे भी आप खुद बात करें कि इमरान खान की मिसकुलटी है तो ये अपर क्लास की और अपर मिडिल क्लास की औरतें उसकी दीवानी है या उसको सपोर्ट करें दैट्स पार्ट लेकिन दुनिया पाकिस्तान की एक बहुत बड़ी तादाद औरतों की ऐसी हैं जो बेचारे बहुत ही मतलब है मुश्किल हालात में वक्त गुजार रहे हैं बहुत ही तकलीफ दह हालात में वक्त गुजार रहे हैं जैसे हमने हिंदुस्तान में मैं एक स्टडी कर रहा था मतलब सेवा के नाम से सेल्फ एम्प्लॉयड वुमेन एसोसिएशन जिसकी लाखों औरतें मेंबर्स हैं उन्होंने अमेजिंग काम किया हिंदुस्तान में लोअर औरतों को जो कि घरों में काम कर रही हैं और ये चीजें कर रही कि उनको किस तरह ऊपर की तरफ लाया जाए मुझे जो चीज हाँ मुझे जो चीज समझ में आ रही है कि ये लैक कर रहा है हमारे मुल्क के अंदर कि हम उन औरतों को कैसे ऊपर लेकर आए बिल्कुल सही बात है आपकी और ये हमारी पुरानी शिकायत रही है और बहस रही है इसके ऊपर लेकिन मकसद रिसर्च का ये है और यही हमने इस बात में तय किया है कि जब एक नैरो और जब गुंजाइश ही नहीं कि आप पब्लिक स्पेसेस आपने खोली नहीं है औरतों के लिए आप बंद कर देते हैं जो एम्प्रेस मार्केट के बाहर खातन वेंडर्स बैठती थी उधर और आपने एक वो यू नो उसको पूरा वर्ल्ड बैंक ने उसको हटा दिया इन द नेम ऑफ क्लीनिंग ऑफ कराची या डेवलपमेंट ऑफ कराची ये तो हम जानते हैं मगर कहने का मकसद ये है कि अगर हम समझ सकते हैं कि जी मैस्टिटी का एजेंडा क्या है या उनके मकासद क्या है तो फिर हमें समझ तो आनी चाहिए ना कि भाई ये हो क्यों रहा है मतलब ये किस वजह से औरतें नहीं निकल रही ये भी तो समझने की जरूरत है पॉलिसीज बनाना मोबिलाइज करना एक्शन लेना एक चीज है लेकिन उसके पीछे बुनियादी अगर आ, समझ नहीं है हमें कि ये हो क्यों रहा है कब से हुआ है कैसे इसको स्ट्रेटेजाइज करें टू कम ओवर इफ वी कीप रोमैंसिंग विद पार्टी कि पार्टी एक मोबिलाइजिंग तरीका है जी कोई बात नहीं अगर मजहब को इस्तेमाल कर ले तो जाहिर है वो कॉन्ट्रोडिक्ट होकर बैकलैश तो आएगा उसका आपके एजेंडा के ऊपर मेरे एजेंडा के तो ये बहुत लाजमी है कि क्रिटिकल एनालिसिस या रिसर्च करें डिसएग्रीमेंट है उसकी सफाई करें उसको सीम आउट करें आयन आउट करें 
تاکہ اسٹریٹیجکلی ویمنس موومنٹ اب نائنٹیز کی جو یہ سارے این جی اوز ہیں جن کی ہم سب تنقید کرتے ہیں انہوں نے تو بہت موبلائز کیا خواتین کو ووٹنگ میں بھی پبلک اسپیسز میں بھی انکم جنریشن اس کو کہلاتے تھے انہوں نے تو اپنا کام کیا ہے پورے پورا اب یہ ہے کہ لیبر فورس پارٹیسپیشن از ناٹ انکریسنگ میکرو اکنامک ایشوز ایٹ ہینڈ اینڈ بہت سے پیپرز لکھے جا رہے ہیں آن وائی اینڈ سو مائنڈ از جسٹ ون انڈرسٹینڈنگ یا ون اینگل ایک ٹائم پیریڈ کے اندر میں نے سوچنے کی کوشش کی ہے کہ بھائی جب سب کچھ ہیجمونکلی میس کیا ناٹ اباؤٹ ٹاکسک اٹس ہیجمونک اور وہ گنجائش ہی نہیں بن رہی جگہ نہیں بن رہی ہے نہ سیاسی ریپرزینٹیشن کی نہ اکنامک ریپرزینٹیشن کی تو کون ہی اکنامک پالیسیز بنائے گا جس کو بڑی ہمدردی ہے خواتین کے ساتھ عمران خان کو میں کہہ رہی ہوں بار بار دلچسپی نہیں ہے کہ خواتین آ کے پبلک سروسز میں اپنا کام کریں رائٹ وہ تو چیریٹی میں اور اس میں چاہتے ہیں تو ظاہر ہے یہ نظریاتی پارٹی جس اور جو پولیٹیکل پارٹیز جو پاور میں ہے اور جو پالیسیز بنا رہے ہیں ان کے اوپر تو دباؤ ڈالنا ہے ان کو کہنا ہے کہ جی کلاس پالیٹکس پالیسیز وغیرہ بدلے سو اٹ از امپورٹنٹ ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ وے دس از کمنگ فرام اس کو ڈی بنک کرے کرٹیک کرے اوپن اپ کرے اور اس کا متبادل جو ہے وہ ہم سجیسٹ کریں ناٹ جسٹ ان ون سیکٹر بٹ اوور آل لیبر لاز لیبر فورس پارٹیسپیشن اس میں دقتیں کیا ہے اینڈ ٹرسٹ می ایون ان بنگلہ دیش جو یہ ریسرچ کی گئی ہے انفارچونیٹلی پرما از اے میجر امپیڈمنٹ ٹو ویمنس پارٹیسپیشن ان فار دس لاٹس آف کمپلیکس ڈیٹیلس فار بٹ آئی ایم جسٹ سیئنگ اسٹارٹنگ پوائنٹ تو ہونے دینا آپ لوگ اگر یہی ادھر ہی بند کر دیں گے کہ جی مطلب اس سطح پہ نہیں جائیں معیشت کچھ اور چیز ہے معیشت کچھ اور چیز نہیں ہے انٹر سیکشنالٹی یہی کہتے ہیں جہاں سب چیزیں جڑی ہوئی ہیں اور ان کی رکاوٹیں جو ہیں اور آبسٹیکلس جو ہیں وہ جوائن کرتی ہیں ایک جگہ پہ تو وہ نیکسس وہ موڈ اینڈ دا نوڈ آف اپریشن وی ہیو ٹو وی ہیو ٹو ایکسپوز دیٹ اینڈ چیلنج دیٹ ایکس تھینک یو ڈاکٹر آفیا تھینک یو سو مچ مسٹر ندیم پراچا ول یو لائک ٹو ہیو سم فائنل کامنٹ اور اینی تھاٹس نہیں وہی ہے میرا بھی یہی ہوتا ہے کہ یوزلی ہم پھنس جاتے ہیں چیزوں میں چاہے یہ ٹاپک ہو جو کوئی بھی ہو وی ہیو ٹو فوکس آن دا سورس آف دا پرابلم ٹھیک ہے صحیح طرح اسٹڈی کرنا چاہیے اس پہ کنسینسز لے لیں یہ ہے سورس آف دا پرابلم جب اس پہ ہم بات کرتے ہیں تو ایک ہمارے اندر انہیرنٹ چیز آ گئی ہے کہ اگر ہم بولیں یہ سورس آف دا پرابلم ہے یہ اس کا ایوڈنس ہے دس لوگ کھڑے ہو جائیں کہ واٹ اباؤٹ دس دین واٹ اباؤٹ دیٹ واٹ اباؤٹ دس ناٹ ریئلائزنگ ایوری تھنگ از انٹر لنک اور جہاں ہم ویمن امپاورمنٹ کی بات کریں یا ہیچمونک میسکنالٹی میسکنالٹی کی بات کریں تو ڈیفینیٹلی جو ابھی آج آفی نے اپنے پیپر پہ لکھا ہے اس سے پہلے کتاب بھی ہے ان کی فیتھ اینڈ فیملزم ان پاکستان اس میں بہت سارے انڈیکیٹرز ہیں ہاؤ وی کین فائنڈ دس سورس اور اس پہ اور بھی بہت کام ہوا ہے اینڈ اس پہ ہم کانسنٹریٹ کریں ناٹ گیٹ ڈسٹریکٹیڈ بائی کلاس فار ایگزامپل ناٹ گیٹ ڈسٹریکٹیڈ بائی ایتھنک رورل اربن آفیا کہ یہ ایک نیشنل پرابلم ہے یہ سوسائٹی کے اندر ایک فلا ہے ہیجمنی کریٹ ہو گئی ہے جو بھی کلاس ہو اس کو ہم نے آئیڈینٹیفائی کرنا ہے اور پھر اس کے مطابق اپنی پالیسی بنانی ہے جب دوسرے پروگرامس لانچ کرنے ہیں جس کی وجہ سے مائنڈ سیٹ تو چینج ہو اوور آل مائنڈ سیٹ تو چینج ہو تو یہ کہوں گا میں آئی تھنک دیٹ از ویئر وی ہیو ٹو کانسنٹریٹ اینڈ واٹ ایور ورک وی ڈو ریسرچ تھرو ریسرچ ایکٹیویزم واٹ ایور Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, uh, to Dr. Afia Zia. Thank you so much for Mr. Nadeem Farooq Paracha. Thank, Thank you so much for taking our time and um, giving us such an illuminating talk. And we look forward to reading more of the academic research and more of such webinars so that we can keep the agenda going. And that's very important. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.